Okay, so um, Hisham can't chair himself, so I'm chairing this session. <laughs> um, <laughs> but actually, it's a good opportunity to thank uh, Hisham and Erz and for organizing the meeting. Um, and and I think it's it's more than that. It's organizing in sense a series of meetings, something that's given continuation to the field. And it's nice to see so many uh, familiar faces. Um, and it's also a chance to reflect on how broad the field has become. Um, and I notice as well that the Institute is Center for Quantum and Topological Systems, which is also a broad yes. uh, institute, which then sort of, I think, welcomes fields like ours, which can be quite all-encompassing, which is very nice. Um, but enough of that. Um, let's begin the session where uh, we have Hisham talking about M-theory <coughs> and matter by a twisted equivariant differential TED. I don't know what that is. <laughs> 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 uh, theory. Theory. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David, for the oh. kind introduction. And I appreciate your presence and everybody else's. This has been wonderful. And I'm very happy uh, that we're able to have this, hopefully now, uh, periodically with the new center. Um, I want to apologize for my voice. The length of this talk, to a large extent, will depend on to the extent that my vocal cords will cooperate. But let's hope for the best, and let's do this. So indeed, my talk is about M3 as a broad umbrella. And recently, with URS, uh, we've been exploring uh, interactions between the mathematics of M-theory and the physics of M-theory in condensed matter physics. And of course, um, applying topology to condensed matter physics is not a new area. Uh, of course, there are things as uh, topological phases of matter and topological order. Um, and Matai has been involved in that for a long time, in a way in parallel to his involvement in high energy physics. But, uh, uh, two decades at least for now. And uh, the application of uh, K-theory to high energy physics also goes way back, again, at least uh, two decades, um, with Witten, Moore, Minazian, um, Matai and collaborators, Richard and others. Um, and then the question becomes, depending on the situation and the setting, uh, how are you going to decorate K-theory, which is the which is the bare topological theory, in order to account for uh, more and more subtle aspects of, say, uh, backgrounds and brains um, and so on. So depending on the setting, you start adding one of these adjectives, and I'll talk about this in detail. Um, so TED is the abbreviation for uh, T. I should have capitalized the E in the D, uh, right? <laughs> TED for short, otherwise the big term, right, to keep writing it. It was a practical um, way of doing this with URSS, and then we realized TED is not a bad thing to have as a, as a shorthand notation. Um, so I'm going to um, explain, this is going to be a huge subject, clearly, from a physics and from a math point of view. I'm going to be uh, giving the overview and highlighting the main ideas. This can get pretty technical, and in fact, the reason this has not been constructed yet, or so I working on that, is due to highly non-trivial um, machinery and technicalities that had to be overcome in order to be able to achieve this. But at the same time, there will be intuitive and physical connections between twisted differential equivariant K theory and, of course, high energy physics, on, not unexpectedly, um, but explicitly and also the new angle, which is the topological phases of matter that uh, we are exploring um, and constructing with ORS, leading eventually all the way, as you will see in ORS's talk, all the way <coughs> to topological quantum computing in some sense, if you like. Um, and all of this is going to be modeled within M-theory as a context using M-brains eventually. So I'll touch a little bit upon that towards the end. <coughs> But this is really going to be the, that last part, the, the subject of ORS's talk. All right, so again, this is an overview of a program with ORS, but then of course it relates, um, as you heard me talk previously, to works uh, with uh, Domenico, Dan, and, and uh, Sasha, who's here. Um, so <clears throat> this is a 
the picture, which is running parallels between high energy physics and condensed matter physics, as we indicated, the general wisdom is going to be that twisted equivariant differential topological K theory, so I corrected the, the capital letters here, TED, um, but let's start on the left, which is more familiar, of course, uh, stable, maybe this angle is better, stable D brains in string theory um, are going to be eventually, given the right adjectives here for the brains, uh, corresponding to the twist, the equivariance, and the geometric refinement, <coughs> eventually those are going to be described by that theory, and, and then it's going to allow to some enhancement to non-perturbative effects, and we did some of that already um, with Urs and, and Vincent uh, a while back, which is needed to account for the lift from string theory to M3 up to, uh, up to the M brains, which will, at a practical level, if you like, at the um, real world type level, is going to be low N Yang Mills theory for, say, hydrodynamics or uh, things of that sort. This is on the high energy side. Now, on the condensed matter side, what's going to be analogous to stable D brains are going to be these uh, free topological phases of of matter, and they're going to be enhanced to interacting phases. So the interacting phases, we're going to see how this is um, going to be uh, non-perturbative in a sense not um, far from this being non-perturbative, which is needed on the condensed matter part to account for something more fundamental as M-brains were on the high energy side, um, which is topological order and then at the practical level, at the end of the day, what it is that you need out of this, you need Anion statistics in order to do topological quantum computing and create topological quantum gates and so on. So this, this last bit here is going to be, not a bit, this last um, perspective here, which is huge, is going to be what Urs is going to be uh, discussing later, although I'll, I'll make the connection to that and Urs will pick it up in, in detail. Okay, so to uh, concretize things a little bit, um, uh, I'm going to highlight some issues and talk about how we go about resolving them. So the first one is something I mentioned briefly earlier, that uh, the TEDK theory hasn't really been constructed. So we might see in the literature people talking about these things and very rarely with all three adjectives thrown together, although that could happen does happen a little bit, um, but we could find one adjective at a time, or two adjectives at a time, and with one adjective, it's okay, with two adjectives, with quite a bit of work, it works out with three adjectives, it's really, really subtle, because you, everything has to be aligned. I mean, I'm saying here schematic things, but at the technical level, a lot of things have to be aligned. It becomes very delicate. You can't get away with any ad hocness once you have all three adjectives thrown in. And then uh, part of what uh, we've been doing with ORS is systematic construction of TEDK theory. This is, is not finalized yet. We have two papers in the pipeline to finalize this, but we've already had several papers. Um, it turns out, and I'll talk about this in detail, the equivariant setting, which you would think would be the easiest or the most transparent, in fact, is the one that's least transparent and most involved, especially when you combine it with the other two adjectives. The second point is M theory. We want to shed some light on M theory. Of course, we haven't figured out what M theory is, but in this context, the shedding light on it means that we have this proposal for an interacting enhancement, which if you remember from the previous table, is um, is what corresponds to non-perturbative effects. And once you do that explicitly, interestingly enough, the hypothesis H that you heard me talk about, most of you at least, uh, for a while, which is that the fields in M theory are described by some uh, homotopy theory of the four sphere, and Sasha will expand on that um, considerably. Um, and the third aspect is something more um, encompassing, let's say, that the non-perturbative aspects of field theory, which are 
lumped together inside M theory are actually practically relevant, right? So this would hopefully answer a question, what is strength, I mean, I don't want to make it too big, but what's these um, a priori not um, ground level constructions um, in, in what we all are doing, for instance, um, does it lead to something really practically relevant? And, and indeed, what we're seeing, what worse is that uh, there's a concrete implementation of topological order through TEDK. So it's becoming hopefully clear that TEDK is playing a thread that connects so many things. And this being something quite concrete and practical and impactful. And, and then in terms of context, all of this is, can be modeled using M brains and hence do have an embedding inside M theory. So again, the context is going to be a mix of high energy and condensed matter. Maybe mix is not really all that accurate. It's going to be um, juggling a high energy and condensed matter hopefully in a coherent way. And, and these are not just analogies, what I indicated earlier. I started with analogies here, but we're gonna see that it, it goes beyond that because things here on the condensed matter side are going to be modeled with things on the left-hand side, not just an analogy, okay? That's very important to highlight. Uh, okay, so, so now I, I wanna um, contextualize a bit more. You know, I like to draw these pictures, not exactly pictures I've seen, I've, I've shown you before. Now you see the two things in orange here. So my talk is gonna be mostly about going from here, the blue shades to the green to topological phases of matter. And then uh, Ors's talk is gonna be also some of these shades going down this direction towards topological quantum computing. And then Sasha is going to talk about the connection to rational homotopy theory, algebraic geometry, and, and Lie theory, right? So this way we have a, a picture encompassing quite a bit of um, structure here. Um, so now I want to take a step back and motivate why we need this TED, for instance. Um, and usually uh, non-trivial physical entities such as fields, charges, and so on, uh, generally take values in cohomology and once you take anomalies and quantum effects into account, then uh, you really need to jazz this up to some generalized cohomology theory, depending on uh, your context. Um, and then this generalized cohomology theory, which is your topological backbone, let's say, you want to add flash to it, and that flash is going to be, and again, it's coming from a physics input, which is uh, twisting it, making it equivariant, and making it differential. Now, twisting it, is, <coughs> I mean, it depends on how you look at it. From a math point of view, it accounts for symmetries of the theory itself. Uh, physically, it's about interaction between the fields. And then, of course, an example of this, which I'll briefly discuss later, and Matai and Fay described it, twisted K theory, the interaction, as an example, interaction between the Navashwar's field, which is the twist, and the Ramonomo fields, let's say, which are what's being twisted. Um, and the second, this is the new ingredient from uh, talks I've given before. So the equivariant setting, of course, you want to account for singularities and, and symmetries when you're in the context of orbifolds and orientifolds. We saw the talk by Eric Sharp, for instance, on uh, orbifolds in this setting. And this is quite subtle. Um, and um, we want to differentially refine it, which is adding the um, genetic data because you want to look at uh, representatives of cohomology classes and not just cohomology classes themselves. Okay, and so for general, I'm going to go through each one briefly. So for generalized cohomology, again, it's motivated by canceling anomalies and usually um, fields in, in physics start little life as being differential forms rationally, uh, classically at the level of supergravity and then they start uh, making their way up, not necessarily linearly this way, but uh, schematically, you, you get you add gauge invariance, you get Dirac cohomology, you quantize, you get integral cohomology, and, or you might jump from here all the way to the generalized cohomology, 
at some sort of quantum level, which is some sort of perturbative, non-perturbative level corresponding to M theory. So this is the schematics here. And um, the generalized cohomology is the top of the mountain, if you like. And the foundation is given by rational homotopy theory. Of course, if the rational level doesn't work, this is not going to work either, right? So this is foundational. Uh, and of course, climbing the mountain is more difficult than going down. You can go down easily by rationalizing. Um, and, uh, but Sasha will pick up this, this part in more uh, detail and, and other connections to this. The twists, uh, I, of course, Mata and Faye gave a very nice description of this, uh, so I'm going to be brief. So you want to account for automorphisms, and of, if one wants to do this um, abstractly, then one would need to look at bundles of spectra and look at sections and so on. And the idea is uh, all this description that we have here, you can twist, twist each one of those, and then the twists are going to have different but related meanings. Um, and um, so uh, the nice example is twisted Dirac cohomology. Matai already indicated this, that um, one can twist also by one forms. That was the original twist by Whitson in the early 80s. Um, and you get um, isomorphic cohomology groups from these complexes. Well, you have quasi-isomorphism here. Um, and the more canonical example is the degree three twist that shows up in twisted K theory. And then the main application is that rationally the monomorph fields twisted by the H field are described by this theory. Now, <coughs> uh, going back to the mountain, want to climb the mountain. How do you climb the mountain? You have to put uh, effort and energy, right? And that um, effort and energy is given by obstruction theory using Postnikov towers at the Herzog spectral sequence. Sliding down is rationalizing, or if you want to systemize it, it's through the churn character in, in that theory. And again, the canonical example is the twisted K theory example. One can do, of course, the differential refinement, which you adjoin differential forms to each one of the cohomology theories, and then the mutation can be decorated in different ways, one of which is, is having a hat on top. And then the idea here, um, more of you speaking is that you adjoin differential forms to your backbone cohomology theory in a compatible way in the RAM cohomology to form this thing on the left here, which is the differential generalized cohomology, which is some sort of a fiber product at the level of um, peaks of spectra, if you want to go with the spectra perspective. Um, so with differential um, generalized cohomology, one has to take differential forms with values in the coefficients of the theory, and it's, this is just a, another way of writing what we had earlier, and, and one can systematically look at the churn characters in this uh, setting. Um, so it's not uncommon to conflate uh, rationals with reals, uh, but actually in reality one has to be careful because I mean, eventually things work out, but one has to be careful, yes? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I mean, when you even rationalize a generalized cohomology theory, you get the rational, perhaps twisted cohomology, and those encode the equations of motion, say, of the Ramoromo fields. So it's very dynamical. We'll see later in my talk, and also expanded in Sasha's talk, the dynamics of the fields in M theory, and I've talked about this before in other occasions, uh, is captured by generalized cohomology, including the dynamics and the equations of motion, of course, flows in the space of coupling constants, things like that. But um, 
that's more in the gauge theory setting. Hopefully in M theory we would not need to uh, deal with such matters, but nonetheless there is going to be uh, quite a bit of the dynamics captured. Not everything. This is schematic after all. So. Yeah, that's going to be the idea that um, you, you are able to, to find uh, the fields and hence the brains of M theory using generalized cohomology. That's part of the idea, yes. I mean, of course, there's no way I can give you anything that encompasses everything we want, right? That's not going to happen. But the point is that this is going to capture a lot of things that we know. Towards the end, I'll give you um, a bunch of examples about cancellation of anomalies which are captured by this perspective, right? A bunch of anomaly cancellations which arise from dynamics clearly uh, will be actually captured by this. So it captures a lot, right? Um, but this is very schematic. I'll get to the details a bit later, all right? But that's a good point. But uh, I mean, modeling physics using mathematics, there's no way you're going to capture everything. And okay, now we're getting philosophical, but even in physics, I don't think we are able to say we understand a physical system completely enough so that once we translate to map, it's going to be complete enough as well. So it depends on what it is that we're trying to model, right? And here when we're talking about M theory, we don't know enough about the physics of M theory to say we have the full picture. But to the extent that that picture is good enough, the math matches that really, really well, okay? But emphasizing that you get a lot of dynamics and you get cancellation of anomalies, everything you care about essentially from equations of motion, um, action functionals, um, and then cancellation of anomalies, and in fact all relevant anomalies is captured by this. I would think this is pretty good. But we're talking abstractly here. Let me get to that part when I get to it and then we can discuss. Okay. Um, Right, and then putting the whole structure together with twisted equivariant differential K theory, uh, you put all these decorations, so you're going to eventually have a cohomology theory E, differentially refined, G equivariant with a twist. And then of course, once in that setting, you need to tell me what you're twisting by, a priori twisting by a cohomology class, but maybe you want to twist by a gerb, a differential cohomology class, or something that respects the equivariance. So, and here, all these three decorations, the hat, the G, and the twist, are going to have to be compatible. So it's highly non-trivial. And um, with ORS, we're going towards constructing this guy in, in detail with, hopefully with these two articles um, done, we will achieve that. And, uh, and like I said earlier, two adjectives at a time, uh, there's been, of course, a lot of rich literature on that. There's no way I can list all of them, uh, but particularly twisted and equivariant. We did some uh, quite a bit of work with my uh, student um, and later postdoc, Dan Grady. Okay, and then um, indeed that application is uh, describing uh, Ramon Ramon fields and twisted differential KO theory and other theories depending on the on the context and. Uh, and eventually, of course, you want to have a group action on, on space-time and on the fields uh, to, to have orbitals and orientables and the singularities themselves. And eventually, of course, the proposal is this and it's uh, also work in progress. Later, again, we're going to see that TEDK theory um, applied to something more involved than space-time, which is the configuration space. We'll see why we're talking about configuration space will be related to um, M theory, mathematically and physically. Okay, so now we'll continue with that um, analogy between high energy physics and, uh, and condensed matter. Uh, so the first table is, uh, is standard. I'm just reviewing um, uh, what, what happens in the literature. And again, there's a vast literature here. I can't list them all, um, but they're in our papers with, with ORS. 
So if you have a single P brain, uh, D brain probe, um, it corresponds to a line bundle over the Brillouin D torus in condensed matter physics. Um, and so basically what replaces space time is this Brillouin uh, torus, which captures the, the lattice or the dual lattice of your crystal. And the topological phase is going to be a single electron state in, uh, in the crystal. If you're looking at the anti uh, guy, then it's going to be a virtual line bundle topologically. And it's going to be a positron in condensed matter. If you look at an unstable system, then it's going to be a Hubbard space bundle over that uh, Brillouin torus. You're going to see how um, that virtual uh, combination is going to appear using, um, as we say here, family of Fredholm operators. And this is given by some famous transform in condensed matter. And the tachyon field is given by these Fredholm operators, as you may recall from uh, string theory. And this is going to correspond to the dress Dirac vacuum operator in condensed matter. Um, stable states eventually is going to be given by um, virtual bundle. And this corresponds to the valence bundle in the condensed matter setting. Um, the stable ones are going to do eventually, once dust settles, given by a K theory class or captured by a K theory class, and that corresponds to the topological phase. The stable things here are stable things here. So, this is um, well documented in the literature um, through the works of, of many people, um, also including Matai and collaborators. Um, once we include uh, symmetry, now this is where the equivalence uh, shows up. We start uh, comparing global symmetries depending on the context, and you get various flavors of K theory. And um, these are these account uh, for these uh, CPT symmetries depending on where you land. I'll talk about this in more detail. And space type orbifolding corresponds to orbifold K theory. It's a variant of equivariant K theory, if you like, and it captures the crystallographic symmetry on the condensed matter side. And also up till here is quite well known. Um, here on is uh, really where the um, main ingredients from uh, the work with ORS shows up, which is probing inside the orbifold singularity is going to be manifested in terms of an inner local system, a twist, a very interesting kind of twist, which is not degree three, and it captures gauge internal symmetries in condensed matter. Um, continuing with more novel things, uh, gauge symmetries, uh, the champ pattern gauge field is described by differential K theory. Um, so this is twisted differential, now we're adding two adjectives. And it captures the Berry connection uh, in condensed matter. The axion deltaon combination is given by some construction in differential K theory along exact sequence, and that capture, captures the mass terms. And Defects are going to be given by flat K theory and they correspond to nodal point charge. And then this last table here is, um, is going towards more towards what force is going to be describing, which is the um, modeling using brains, the uh, geometric engineering of this, if you like. So including defects, and this is where the anions will show up and hence the topological um, connection in, in condensed matter. Um, so defect brains are going to correspond to punctures, and they correspond to um, the same number of band nodes. And if you have interaction of probes around defects, they're going to correspond to certain vector bundles over n configuration spaces, which is the configuration spaces of n points moving around. And then you have um, and punctured uh, torus, so it's going to be quite uh, a construction here. But it's, it's very nicely going to capture interacting n electron states, each uh, point corresponding to an electron around n bad nodes. And then eventually, looking at um, symmetries and holonomy uh, is going to connect, is going to be what's connecting to this, to the anions. And the annuals are what are going to be connecting to topological quantum gates and topological quantum computing. And we'll see that uh, part in Ursa's talk. 
All right, so um, the covariance setting, I already mentioned that it's quite subtle, and the main subtlety is somewhat surprisingly maybe, given what I said, that rationalizing is an easy business, it's not. Um, so looking at the twisted equivariant churn character, but now as what? You want it as something that captures a lot of structure. I'm not gonna go into what that means. If you want it as a map of equivariant moduli stacks, in order for you to construct the differential theory and add, right? So in the differential theory, you need the churn character to be thrown in into the theory for it to become differential. So doing this, um, there are two difficulties. First, the spaces that you encounter are not simply connected or nil pretend, and that leads to a complication of rational homotopy theory in general, although in a in, the, in another setting, we'll see with Sasha how um, that can be circumvented in that setting uh, of, of um, reduction of M theory on Tori. And uh, the equivariant eilenberg maclean spaces, which are your classifying spaces, um, will lead to a local system, and that's going to be encompassed by a degree one twist. And by uh, equivariant eilenberg maclean spaces, we mean whatever classifies equivariant gerbs. And we'll see how some of this works in the applications. So things um, could get quite technical. So this is not to get technical, but just to show you schematically what's happening here. So we want to embrace this uh, local system. First, in topology, you, you are advised to avoid local systems if you can, but if you embrace them, then good things happen sometimes. This is one of those instances. Um, so, uh, <coughs> so this allows for the appearance of conformal blocks and braid group statistics, and of course, these are needed for um, accounting uh, for anions and hence uh, topological quantum computing. And this part is, again, what's going to be expanded on in Orsi's talk. And, um, and then, of course, this solidifies expectations in the literature. So the idea is you want to look at um, uh, an, an action of G um, on X. So here's going to be internal and external symmetries. And that's why you have an action on X and then a universal action for the internal symmetries. And, um, and uh, of course, you can model uh, K-theory using Fraunhelm operators, and I'll talk about that in detail if I have time. And then PUH accounts for the uh, twisting. Um, I mean, this shows up in, in the works of, of Matai, and the main idea here is that uh, what shows up is the Pontryagin dual group, if you chase it, and the inner local system is the factorization for the classifying space of this Pontryagin dual group. Um, and uh, we have some assumptions here. I mean, all the groups are finite um, subgroups of SU2. We need that uh, technically in order for things to work, but this is not a loss of generality in practice. And this is another way of, of looking at it. Um, you factorize the maps, and from, um, twists of, from, from the twists you're starting with, you get the factorization into an inner local system and the usual bundle gerbs that you expect. This is what's expected, and this is a surprise, if you like, which is a corresponds to degree one twist. This is yet another way of looking at it. Um, and so I'll, I'll skip the technical details here and, and go down here. Um, so eventually, we'll add these symmetries coming from condensed matter, uh, CPT. Um, two at a time, it turns out. Uh, I'll get to that in a bit. This is an overview. So the full uh, quantum symmetry twist is gonna be this space, and, um, and, and this is unitary spaces on Hilbert's, unitary group on Hilbert space. Um, I'll explain why we have two copies, uh, basically because we have uh, pairs. Um, and the idea here, let's look at this as a, as a box. You have these equivariant bundle gerbs, which is what you normally would expect inside the full uh, quantum symmetry twist. So this is what is done in the literature and what we focus on and uh, run with. But the right-hand side is very intriguing that eventually, really, you want a theory which is twisted by these things, which goes 
seem to go beyond K theory. Um, okay, so in terms of the churn character, um, that's the usual story, um, looking at it in the complex setting. And, and um, uh, once we uh, twist it, you account for that using twisted DRAM. All of that is what I mentioned earlier, some other guys, but now the new ingredient is this um, local system for uh, finite uh, groups, cyclic groups in this case. And um, it's uh, twisted equivariant churn character is going to be given by what you expect, but now you have twisted differentials, except that the twist is a multiple of a one form rather than being a three form. And this is the hidden uh, one twisting um, highlighted in my work with Urs that will be related to annuals. And again, that's the degree one part is what Urs is going to be expand on and tell you where it comes from, from the um, uh, physics and to, and to some extent math point of view as well. Yes? Sorry? You combine? Yeah, you can have, you can have uh, twists at, at once, degree one and degree three, yeah. That's what we are doing, but we're focusing on one at a time for, to, to uh, expose what's hidden in each. Because the degree three guy, we already know what comes out of that, it's quite classical. So we're expanding what comes out of the degree one. But they're present together, and they're compatible. Um, right, so from here on, um, of course, I don't have enough time to go in detail into all of this, but just to give you some idea about what we discussed earlier, uh, so why k theory in condensed matter? Um, so basically, you're looking at a system where you have a state, an anti-state, uh, electron, positron, remember D-brains, anti-D-brains, right? It sounds right, uh, but one can actually do it explicitly, and um, it turns out, after looking for a while, Oris and I, that uh, uh, four years ago or so, 45 years ago, um, there's a, a modeling of the vacuum of the free Dirac field in a Coulomb background using Fredholm operators and um, on a single electron positron Hilbert spaces, and they decompose them this way. And you've got the uh, electron state in dressed vacuum and that of the positron in the co-kernel. And then the index, which is the difference of these dimensions, is going to be some measure of the total charge. So it's quite natural um, from a physics and math point of view uh, that this would be the case, that you use uh, Fredholm operators. And, and of course, Fredholm operators, operators, in a way, model K theory as well. The next question is, what symmetry operators act on these? And, um, and um, one would want to combine the unitary uh, groups, um, which, I mean, we're dealing with graded Fredholm, so that's why we have two copies, as I indicated earlier. And this is a doubling of what we would have from before, but uh, more so now in this context, we want to account for these involutions, let's say P and T. And it turns out uh, these are not independent, the C, P, and T. This is, if you like, a CPT, uh, uh, a verification of CPT. Um, and they act by conjugation, depending on which one you're talking about. Could be complex conjugate, transpose, the combination, et cetera. <coughs> Excuse me. So the, again, <coughs> the relation to complex K theory goes a while back, <coughs> but you can look, <coughs> excuse me, at the space of Fredholm operators, and, uh, and you can form the equivalent of a spectrum using those, depending whether you're in the complex setting, you need um, two of those, or if you're in the um, real setting, you, get, you need eight of those. You can uh, form uh, graded uh, uh, spaces that way. Okay. <coughs> and. Um, and now, since we're highlighting the equivariance, uh, where do these groups come from? I want to highlight um, subtleties in terms of the groups. Um, so, uh, of course, we have the rotations and the translations, and uh, the crystal is part of the translation. 
and um, the, the, the crystal lattice and the crystallographic group is part of the um, semi-direct product and the, there's a point group which is part of the rotation part. And this is the brilliant torus we've been talking about, which is the quotient of all uh, momenta by the lattice ones, which happens to uh, be the Pontryagin uh, dual. And then the point symmetries act on the brilliant torus in that factorized way. And we, um, we, we, one can call uh, the combination of the point group with the T and C uh, symmetries, sorry, T and C, um, as the external group, and and then you can quotient you can um, quotient by that uh, action. Um, so and one can um, look and, and and see what the meaning of all these symmetries correspond to in terms of BT is the blue one torus. Um, the main point here is that. Um, when you act by G on the on the brilliant torus, you're going to have an external action. So the external uh, groups, if you like, are going to act on the space itself. But the internal ones, of course, don't act on the space. They act universally. Yes. No, not yet. Sorry. Uh, I'm reviewing cl uh, context for next matter. Yeah. Actually, that's a good point in. In a way, I should uh, hurry up. Okay. Um, all right. Let's keep going. Uh, and one can uh, describe uh, various uh, constructions, uh, symmetry protected phases, symmetry enhanced phases, and, and so on. And one can um, uh, describe um, things further using all kinds of variants of, of K theory, and for instance, equivalent KR, and so on. Um, so the concrete setting is if this valence bundle um, is uh, what's going to be eventually modeled by, by k theory just to make things explicit, and it's a bundle over the brillouin torus. If you like, you can think of this as the analog of champ pattern. These are brains or space time, um, something like that. And there are classification of these things depending on the chemical potential. Matai has done quite a uh, bit of work on this, um, fundamental work with the young. Um, and one can account for these symmetries and it's compatible with, the, uh, with what we expect from our experience in applying K theory to, uh, to uh, strength, various flavors of strength theory, KR and so on. And there's this uh, tenfold way, if you like, uh, that describes the, uh, these quantum symmetries in condensed matter. And uh, you get all these uh, flavors of, of K theory with these cohomology degrees, so for instance, in degree zero, one can get um, KO theory um, um, in a consistent fashion. So now, enter M theory. So I want to look at, oops, that wasn't bad. Okay, interacting enhancement via hypothesis H, which means bringing in M theory. So okay, so what's the context here? Uh, so interacting um, N electron wave functions are really functions on um, of M, uh, on the space of M points in the brillouin torus. You have the brillouin torus, and we got points on it. By uh, Pauli, um, these should uh, span vector bundle away from the locus of coinciding points. So you need to get rid of points colliding. Um, so you got the bundle over this is described by what's called the configuration space of points, configuration space of N points on the Brillouin torus, and you subtract, you remove the, uh, the locus of, of these uh, n uh, points, and this is a, a way of describing it, and this is called the configuration space of m points. And again, whenever you have singular things or uh, locations that seem to, to, to have degeneration, you want to try to avoid it sometimes, but we want to avoid them, to, to embrace them, actually, not avoid them, as we did for singularities. And um, so there are deep theorems, and, and Urs is going to expand on this uh, due to Hobbes, Bontragen, and Siegel. Um, uh, we've talked about this uh, elsewhere um, and in probably the previous version of this conference. Um, so these theorems relate configurations of points to cohomotopy theory, uh, which is an Annabelian generalized cohomology theory, which corresponds to homotopy classes of maps from X to the N sphere. 
And if you like, this is a nonlinear version of the linear cohomology or abelian cohomology, which is ordinary cohomology, which is maps to allenberg maclean space, which is a linearization of the sphere. So this guy is a linearization of that in a way that is made um, explicit using Postnikov towers as I did with, with Dan, with Dan Grady. So the main point here is hypothesis H, which at this level, level of differential form, says that, the, that um, mapping to, uh, to S4 here, when you take N equals four, is going to capture the dynamics of the fields at that level, at the rational level. Um, and, uh, and what cohomology sees is actually without the dynamics. So in a way, this is a, a, a quite a bit of an improvement from a dynamical point of view um, over, over this. But of course, we can see a lot more, and uh, one can actually twist this theory. So I've been talking about twisting uh, Whitehead style generalized cohomology theories, but can, you can twist nonlinear um, cohomology theories as well. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so that's a good point. So what I'm talking about here, so I think this is what you meant by dynamics, that, that we need to bring in the metric. Yes. So, okay, so that's a good point, and, and it, we've discussed this um, in, in the past, of course. Um, so the, the idea here is, of course, that G7 starts out as being star G4, right? And that's how you include the metric. But we choose a setting in, on all what we do in, in describing fields of physics and, to some extent, their dynamics by, um, by suppressing the metric. And then you can add metric information by looking at geometric, some, some sort of geometric homotopy theory, which eventually we'll need. If, uh, but the metric isn't really giving you uh, something about the deep structure of the theory, right? Eventually, eventually you need it in order to describe dynamics and see how things flow. But, you know, it, it is frozen. You can bring it in eventually later. But I'm saying you're not gaining anything at this stage by putting in a metric, right? If anything, it's a nuance. So you need to put it on the side so you can extract uh, fundamental mathematical aspects of the theory, and then eventually you put the metric. The metric is a secondary thing from this point of view, you see? I think it's, it's semantics. It depends on what you mean by dynamics. I think you're insisting that dynamics means metric. And I'm saying these are equations of motion, don't involve metric. You can call them Bianchi identities, but they're describing um, how things interact, right? Without the metric, right? Eventually you'll bring the metric, that's fine. But the metric isn't going to reveal things to you that are revolutionary here. It's going to be an icing on the cake in the end to tell you how you're going to write down PDEs. It's not going to reveal anything hidden for you here. We're not trying to model Einstein's equations. We're trying to extract the geometric and the topological aspects of physical theories. That's what we're trying to do. And from a non-perturbative point of view, that's the main aspect, the geometric and the topological part. The metric, if anything, it's something on the side, right? From an unperturbative point of view. David? I mean, there are two formulations. There's a formulation with G4 and, and G7 independently, and there's a formulation with the 
Right, uh, and I'm, yeah, that's a good point, but I'm saying I'm postponing doing that, right? Because it's not going to give me anything here. Mm. But I mean, I can, I can put it, but we don't transparently uh, account for a metric in, in homotopy theory, right? So we say, okay, you can add that as a constraint. I mean, we're not counting. Okay. Right. Right. But you do, but to what purpose? If you want to solve equations, that's fine. But if you want to understand the structure, right, it's okay for you to postpone imposing that constraint. Why does it matter for the, for the geometric structure if you're... Yeah, so we we'll keep that in mind as a constraint that eventually you need to, to impose, right? We'll keep that in mind. Can I? Right? Yes. Is may, may I just make a comment just to highlight for people that will find this unfamiliar? It's exactly the same principle that applies to K-theory and string theory. Where you first imply just the Bianchi identities for all the K-fields, and then the full equations of motion is imposed by adding self-duality of the fields so yes. of the K-theory class. At the end. done after the So fact. you decompose... That's, that's the point, I mean, just to recall, I think maybe this is an issue that many people don't quite understand how even the K-theory quantization works. You say, okay, what does it mean for fields and string theory to be quantized in K-theory? Well, you take the original equations of motion, you decompose them into one part that is actually part of a churn character, if you wish, the, the differential relation satisfied in the churn character of a generalized cohomology theory, and then there is a self duality constraint which involves the background matrix. And the point of the K-theory classification is that all the subtleties in the, you know, condensation of the tachyon, all this topological information is all in the K-theory, and then in the end you want to restrict those that satisfy a self-duality constraint. And at this point we're doing, what Hisham is presenting is exactly this first part, the cohomological part, and in the end, yes, one will bring in the metric and impose self-duality. We haven't written this out yet, but there's comments, if anybody's interested, we indicate how we think this will work in the article with ADE, background cohomology theory in the title. This will involve Cartan geometry, and we know how to do it, we haven't written it down yet, but it's the usual way of setting up fields. This wasn't the main point, but I'm happy with this discussion. This is important, yeah, but I appreciate the questions, yes. Good. Okay, very good. Um, okay, so this is, this is why, so going back, we're looking at interacting systems, we're looking at configuration, uh, spaces, and uh, and the reason we're looking at configuration spaces are a nice feature. It connects to cohomotopy theory, which captures the, the fields as we're discussing here. And uh, that theory can be twisted using tangential structures. And um, we end up, just to um, emphasize, um, and this is something I've talked about before, that this is not the only thing that this uh, theory sees, in fact, it allows for translations of all these anomalies that we encounter, and this is something I talked about in the previous version of this conference, or probably last year in Singapore, or the year before. Um, so all these anomaly cancellations that you encounter in M theory, they are canceled in the context of cohomotopy. Right? We made a point of having cohomotopy in, in all, essentially all the title. Right? Um, this is what it does. It does considerable amount of consistency checks that are highly non-trivial, right? So the modulo, right, some issues with dealing with that self-duality towards the end, which again, as Urs um, highlighted, that we think we know how to address it fully satisfactorily, everything falls in place very nicely. All right, so now I hope I convinced you to, to a good extent that cohomotopy theory is good, we go back and, and look at the interacting system. So if you have a single electron, that's what we described earlier and what's in the literature. Now if you have multiple electrons, you want to look at interacting ground states. 
And now the beautiful thing here is that K theory is still applies, and this is, if you like, the, the table of what's going on here. Classically, for a single electron, you have your space. If you have multiple electrons interacting, classically still, you have to look at um, maps to this S4, which is called cohomotopy. We have to look at moduli. This is decorated a little bit. It's not just that bare thing. And then if you have a quantum level, so you have to look at a K theory of some sort of X. And then here, if you want to look at the quantum interacting electron systems, you have to look at K theory, not of space time, but K theory of this moduli space, if you like, coming from cohomotopy. Now we're going one level further. Um, and then to, uh, to say that this is not a strange idea, correlators in quantum field, sorry, this is uh, QFT. Correlators in, in uh, various quantum field theories uh, can be described as some cohomology, in this case, basic uh, of configuration spaces. And then one can ask from another angle, um, can we not look at the generalized cohomology of configuration spaces? And hopefully that'll give us even more information than um, the Ram cohomology, for instance. Um, and the idea here is that this is the picture that's going to be expanded on, I'm running out of time, of course, expanding on Norse's talk that uh, TEDK theory is going to see this braiding picture at the very detailed level, from a physics and mathematics point of view, which is, of course, about anions. So Urs will explain how there were shortcomings in both the physical and the mathematical arrival at anions, which this resolves. So then the proposal is that in various ways, so for instance, go down here, that quantum observables on the non-perturbative interacting ground states are in generalized cohomology, I mean, in particular, TEDK theory in this uh, case of twisted cohomotopy moduli, but other generalized cohomology theories might keep an open mind, might see even more, although TEDK theory seems to be canonical to a large extent. Um, and, and here, I want to highlight um, a parallel between uh, the deep brain picture interacting brains, if you want to uh, model these things using cohomotopy, this uh, column, if you like, is what I described uh, in previous versions of this conference. So charge quantization is described by four cohomotopy. The cycle space is the configuration space in R3. And of course, R3 has to do with the, with the dimensions arising from the intersections here. And this is described by weight systems and chord diagrams. Uh, are what describe the observables. This is what we're talking about in this version of the conference, which is modeling um, the earlier context using M brains. And uh, the cohomology theory will be three cohomotopy. You're going to have an analogous configuration space, and you're going to uh, be able to find observables using conformal blocks and braid group representations. And again, this is what Force is going to expand on. And, uh, and, and uh, this is, a, again, a list of things that arise from the earlier column, this one, which is a precursor of what we're doing today. And it led to a bunch of things that I talked about, Urs and I, um, last, uh, last uh, time. So that's what I have. Thank you very much. <clears throat> That's all right. Yeah, so what, what is the group there when you look at equivariant uh, in the condensed matter setting, the, the uh, equivariant KT? Uh, right, so that's something I, um, I went through very quickly and I skipped um, here. Um, so the, the group G factorizes into an external part. So there's the point symmetry that arises from the O factor of the Euclidean isometry group uh, here. And then you've got, oops, sorry, uh, the various combinations here. So you split them into external and internal. And then the idea is that, of course, the external group is going to be what acts on your actual slab. And the internal guy is going to act universally. It doesn't act on the slab. It acts abstractly. 
And that's why there is this factorization here. Well, thank you. Yeah? Thanks ahead. very much. Uh, just one other question. Uh, you probably have an answer. But the, is there a corresponding, can you describe like the bulk boundary correspondence in this setting? Uh, so there's going to be some holography and duality in Urs's talk, yes. Okay. Uh, so he'll describe some of that. Thank yes. you. Thanks about that. <coughs> sure. Yes. Uh, ten minutes. Ten minutes back for Ursus' talk. Okay. Good. Thank you, everyone.